uh, take a seat and let me welcome uh, somebody up to the stage. I, I won't say everything because I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Um, my name's Sam and I, I work for the diocese here as Bishop's Chaplain. Um, but what's your name and where do you come from? Uh, so um, uh, my name is Stephen, Stephen Cottrell, and uh, I'm the 98th Archbishop of York. <laughs> Great. Um, well, welcome, 98. Mm -hmm. And it is good to have you here. We're delighted that you're here in the diocese. We'll come a little bit to that in a minute. But first, you're, you're the Archbishop of York. How did that come about? And presuming you had a choice in the matter, at some point you had to say yes. What made you say yes? Yeah, well, I mean, what I usually like to say is, Hey, I went down the job centre one day and struck really, really lucky Archbishop of York. Um, or sometimes I say that there's another person called Stephen Cottrell who's wise and holy, um, and uh, somehow the letters got muddled, and I, I got the letter, and sooner or later they're going to realise their mistake, and at which point I'll say, I fully understand, I'm surprised it took you this long to realise, but the real story is uh, being uh, a bishop and an archbishop is what's called a crown appointment. That doesn't actually mean the Queen chooses who's going to be the bishop. The Queen asks the Prime Minister. Thankfully, it's not the Prime Minister who makes the choice either. He asks, um, we won't go there, uh, he asks uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury or the Archbishop of York, depending upon where the vacancy is. Uh, and then a, a, a commission gets together with elected people from York, in this case, elected people from the National Church, one or two others for an archbishop, and they, and they, and they do a search, really. What that means is at some point your life is co totally mucked up and disturbed because you get a phone call saying your name has been put forward as somebody who might be, in my case, the next Archbishop of York. So at that point I could have said no. Uh, but actually, uh, we've all been at these times in our lives where you sense maybe one chapter of your life is coming to an end, but you're not quite sure what the next chapter is. I was at that point in my life thinking, uh, Lord, wh where, where do you want me to go next? Turns out it was to be the Archbishop of York. Oh, excellent. And having said yes, what were, and I suppose still are, your hopes? for your time in this role? Yeah, well, I mean, there's, there's a story I like to tell, I'll tell it really quickly, of, of one of the kings of France. Um, he, in, in, you know, in France, all the kings were called Louis, or most of them were, so I can't remember which Louis it was. Let's, let's call him Louis the Umpteenth. I don't know which one it was. Um, and he had lots of titles. Um, and, uh, like, King, Emperor, Defender of the Faith, all these great titles, but he always signed his name Louis of Poissy. And people said to him, you know, King, why do you sign your name Louis of Poissy when you've got all these other titles? Um, and he said, Poissy was the place where I was baptised. I consider it the highest honour. Um, so actually, I should have inter I introduced myself wrongly. I'm not the Archbishop of York, I'm Stephen of Hadley, because um, that was the place where I was baptised. Um, and so you ask me what my hopes are. My hopes are simply that I can be a voice and an instrument for the gospel of Jesus Christ here in the north, um, that I can fulfill not, not, not the promises I made as a bishop or a priest, the promises I made at my baptism uh, to turn to Jesus, to follow him, and to try to live my life in such a way as others might also come to know him and to serve him. So in that sense, we're no different. Um, baptism is the highest honour. We are therefore all equals uh, in, in the body of Christ. And I hope that what I hope may also be what you hope. You. That's really good. And what has brought you here? That's the, the final question. What's brought you here? Why are you with us? And what have you been up to whilst you've been here? 
Sam, it's obviously been a long day. You drove me here, so uh, it was you. <laughs> <laughs> it has been a long it was, weekend. It was you and your car. Um, so, um, no, I'm really delighted to be here, and I believe that one of the reasons God has called me to be the Archbishop of York um, is something about trying to revive and reinvigorate and inspire the church here in the north. Um, and so my responsibilities cross the whole of what's called the, you know, the northern province, the province of York, uh, which includes, of course, the great diocese of Blackburn. Uh, so when Bishop Julian wrote to me whenever it was and said, come and spend a few days uh, on mission, speaking and teaching and being alongside the church here, um, you know, it, was a, it, you know it, it resonated with my heart's desire. I'm really, really glad to be here. And, and although, of course, when you invited me, Julian, you didn't know, I didn't know that this was in the last lap of your ministry as bishop, but I'm so glad and pleased that I've been able to come here while Julian is still in post, and because it gives me a chance to, uh, to thank God for his wonderfully faithful, inspiring, um, and creative ministry here in this diocese, and to be alongside him in mission. So basically, I'm here because you asked me to be here, and it's great. <laughs> Well, we're delighted that you've come, and we're going to hear a little bit more from you in a, in a bit, and we're going to hear some more of your story and stories. But we do have a couple of other stories and people who are going to tell us their stories. So I'm going to invite Bishop Jill up, who in turn will tell us a little bit about who to expect. So we'll take a Thank you, Sam. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming tonight on the night of the Championship League final. So, all those Liverpool football supporters out here, I'm going to make this quick. No, no, honestly. Um, can I invite Hannah to come out? Because I met Hannah um, eight months ago, and Hannah had moved from the south, a bit where uh, Archbishop Stephen comes from, all the way from Black Wall, Black Walt? Black Heath. Or oh, Black Heath, <laughs> Black something. <laughs> all the way to Blackpool. And um, the main thing about being a bishop here is that I get to look around Lancashire and spot amazing treasure that is bubbling up locally. But also, you seem to be bringing in incredible people across the country. So Hannah, um, can you tell us a little bit about how you came to faith? and then maybe how you came up here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I came, I grew up in a Christian home um, and had, have always been involved in the wonderful life of church work um, from, a, from a young age. Um, and actually it was one of my friends when I, was, when I was a teenager that said to me, you know, you can, you can be involved in church all you want, but if you don't believe it for yourself, it's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, and that really struck a chord with me. Um, and I grew up on a farm um, okay. in Suffolk. So I was in Blackheath, but I actually grew up on a farm in Suffolk. And, and I was in a field one day and I said, Jesus, I want this for myself. Um, and it really was that simple. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and a verse came to my head, um, which um, has kind of stuck with me. Um, in a previous life, I was a music teacher, and it's a verse that um, has spoken to me a lot. And it's uh, Zephaniah 3.17, which says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Oh, I just love beautiful. that picture. Okay. I, I love that picture oh. of God uh, rejoicing over me and us um, with singing. Yeah, well, I think he, there's massive songs in the heavenly realms when you have heard the call to come up to Blackpool, yeah. the best town in the country. <laughs> <laughs> I've provided the audience there. <laughs> no, no, a Blackburn's very good too. Um, and Burnley's okay, um, but let's just move on from Bishop um, popped up. So, and, and, but you, you came to lead the Eden team yeah. at the Beacon Church in, on the Revo Estate. And um, what kind of call do you up from being head of music in school in Blackheath yeah. to, the, to Blackpool? Um, so me and my husband really felt the call together and we lead the Eden team here together um, and for about a year before we, we moved um, we'd been saying to each other um, something is next, we're not quite sure what it is um, 
but it feels like something big. Um, and Matt, my husband, was a youth worker in Blackheath. Um, I was working in a school um, down the road. Um, and we were looking at jobs everywhere. We looked at jobs in, in Dubai. In oh, wow. Must Dubai or Blackpool? Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Matt quite liked the idea of me teaching and okay. him being able to sit on a beach, I think, <laughs> was the reality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we looked everywhere, and then it was out of the blue, we got a message from um, a friend of ours who we hadn't spoken to for, for a long time, who was my youth worker growing up, who happens to be a vicar in Blackpool, um, Adrian, um, and he said, how are you? And we said, you don't ask that. <laughs> when you haven't spoken to someone for a long time, what do you want? <laughs> um, and, and we chatted on Zoom, and he shared a heart for Revo, um, which is um, just literally down the road, about 10 minutes from here. Um, second most deprived area of the country, um, highest for child poverty in the country. And he shared a vision that he had for um, Beacon Church to be, um, yeah, a beacon to shed forth God's light mm. in that place. And, and we were sold, literally, we were sold on Zoom. Um, in lockdown, a week later, we were in the car coming up here for an interview, um, and we walked the streets um, and we prayed, and and Matt turned to me and said, "This is where Jesus would be." Wow! So it's where we need to go. Oh! And that was it. That was it. And now here you are, and here you are on stage. So it's a good story as well, really. And the families at four happens on us on. Uh, this, is, this is the advert bit here. Uh, families at Four <laughs> happens on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, is that right, yeah. Yeah, so um, um, Families at Four is a congregation that me and Matt lead together. Um, we launched it back in September off the back of a holiday club at Beacon Church um, where we really, we were chatting to some parents who said um, the problem with Revo and the problem with where we live um, is there's just nowhere safe. There's nowhere for community and there's nowhere where we feel our children are safe. Um, so we launched this service on a Sunday afternoon with no expectation, really, um, other than come along. We do a meal at the end of it. Um, the first week we opened the door and every seat was full. Um, wow. And it's pretty much continued like that. And it, it's, a, it's a church full of people that are unchurched. About 90% of our congregation um, at the moment wouldn't call themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have become Christians in the last nine months. Um, and every week we pray together, every week they hear the gospel, every week we eat together, and, and it's become family on mission. Okay, oh, brilliant. Well, thank you, uh, Hannah, because it's delight to be, well, I'm delighted you're part of the wider family here as well. So yeah, thank, thank you. you, big round of applause for Hannah. <laughs> And I now get the uh, privilege to introduce you to someone who um, I was speaking to a friend I made through in Wales, um, in the south of Wales, she's a vicar, and she said, do you know this woman? I hear she lives in Lancashire. Um, she's called Anne Beverly. My kids have seen her on TikTok, so I'd like to invite the most famous woman I know <laughs> on to stage, Anne Beverly. <laughs> so, uh, uh, we're pulling out all our best stories here, aren't we? So, Anne, Anne you're, you're, you're many hats, aren't you? You are the um, vicar of Christchurch Weston. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh you've got a I fight club. I think there club. may be a Christchurch Weston contingent. Yeah, okay, absolutely. brilliant. You're, pay, you're paying people to come. No, 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 no. And you're area dean. You're dean of women's ministry. We have amazing women in this diocese, of which, sure do. you know, great specimens on stage right now. But, um, and a massive TikTok following. But that's actually not what you're going to talk about, is it? No. You've got some, uh, an interesting story in your own right. So over to you, Anne, for your story. Thank you. Oh, it's such a privilege to be able to come here. Um, I did my curacy in Blackpool, and it's wonderful to be able to come back um, to Blackpool and to be speaking here. I think you'll be quite glad that I'm speaking and not singing. When I was a little girl, my mum used to say to me, she'd say, oh, Aran, she says, she sings like a bird. Problem is, it's a vulture. 
<laughs> so you'll be really pleased that I'm not singing. But I have to say that I um, was really privileged as a child because I was brought up in a Christian family. Both of my parents were Christians and they took me to church as a child. They prayed with me and they read the Bible with me. I remember when I was pregnant with my first child and I thought, do you know what? If I can be half the mum that my mum was, I'll actually do all right. So when I was pregnant with my first daughter, I decided to read every single book I could find my hands on um, about parenting. And by the time I went into labor, I was dead confident. I knew everything that was to know about being a mum. <laughs> yeah, right. My daughter was born around midday, um, and we were both quite poorly, so it was about 12 hours later before we got onto the ward. We'd not been on the ward very long when she started to cry. And I, had, I didn't know what she was crying for, and eventually this lovely, very patient midwife comes in. She says, Mrs. Beverly, are you okay? And I said, my daughter's crying, and I don't know why she's crying. And she said, well, when was the last time you fed her? And I just looked at her and went, well, I haven't fed her. So this poor child's been alive for 12 hours and I've never fed her. And I might have read all of those books, but I didn't know that you had to feed babies round the clock. Nobody told me that. So this poor midwife, you know, helped me out and showed me that I actually had to feed this child every four hours, even in the middle of the night. But once I'd sort of, you know, I hadn't starved my daughter once I'd worked so, out how to do that. So you can't, you can't sing and you can't feed people, Anne. It's no. not, this is I'm not, not doing very well. I, I built you up too much, but keep going, keep going. <laughs> yeah, I'm not great at this. <laughs> so fast forward two years and my son's born. When I went into labour with my son, I'm like, okay, I've got it. You know, I've done this before. I know I've got to feed this child. I've sorted this out. I know what I'm doing. And do you know what? For the first two years, I really did know what I was doing. He was awesome. He was dead good. He ate, he slept, and he filled his nappy. Genius. That was it for two years. And when he was about two years old, um, one of the health visitors, you know you have the health visitors that come in to do like these welfare checks and things and developmental checks. So the health visitor arrives and um, she says to my son, uh, can you count to 10? And he says, yeah, I, ca I can count to 10. So she said, can you count to 10 for me? And he just looked at her and he said, do you want me to count in English, French, or Japanese? No. It was two. I know. So, of course, I'm there, you know. I'm great at this parenting lock. I've got a two-year-old who can count to ten in three different languages. I'm doing all right here. And at the end of this development check, the, the, the health visitor says to me, Mrs. Beverly, I have got a slight concern. She said, because your son doesn't make eye contact. And I'm looking at her going, are you kidding me? You can count to ten in three languages. I don't care if he doesn't look at you. But funnily enough, she knew a lot more what she was talking about than I did. And over the next few years, life with my son became very, very difficult, incredibly so. Once he started school at the age of four, things became really bad. He was very naughty. Um, he was violent. He, um, we couldn't get him to do anything. And he went from being a child who never cried as a baby to a child who cried all the time. We actually got to our wits end and, and eventually my husband and I decided that we were going to keep a diary. So we had two rules. We sat down and we said, every day for 30 days, we have to find one thing that he's done that's really good. And I can assure you that was hard. And the second thing, that, the second rule was that you wrote the diary, then you turned the page and you weren't allowed to look back. You had to start the next day with a fresh page. The end of the 30 days, it was a night in January, we sat down to read the diary. Now I have to tell you that that night was by far the worst night of my life. When we looked back through this diary and we looked and we realized, sat there in black and white in front of us, just how hard our lives were, how much his behavior was affecting us, how much it was affecting um, my, older, my older daughter, and just how terribly unhappy he was. I remember after we'd read the diary, I went upstairs and I was sat on my bedroom floor and I was screaming out to God. I wasn't praying, I was shouting at him. 
And I was sobbing my heart out. And I'm saying, God, I do not know how to bring this child up. I don't know what to do. And eventually, once I'd sort of cried myself out and I got to the point where I was exhausted, I just looked up to heaven and I said, are you not even listening to me? Do you not even care? And then I had this vision. And I know it was a vision because it had to have come from God. And God said to me, um, this voice came in, he said, I have given you this child. And I had this vision of me holding a newborn baby. And when I looked down, this baby was my son. And I was holding him in my arms like you rock a baby as I was sat on the floor. And this voice says, I have given you this child and I expect you to look after him and then God came and he sat down on the floor next to me and he took his really strong arms and he put his arms underneath my arms as I'm carrying this baby and he said but I'm going to carry you as you carry this child that night was a, a turning point it was a turning point for me it was a turning point for him we eventually um, received a diagnosis of uh, Asperger's for him um, and uh, all that entails. He is now 14 years old and up here, which he thinks is brilliant because he's taller than me. I keep telling him he might be taller, but he's not cleverer. Um, not yet, anyway. <laughs> um, and he's awesome. You know, every time I look at my son, I look at him and I don't see all the problems and I don't see the bad things and I don't see the difficulties my heart just bursts with love and pride and joy for this amazing young man who has achieved so much in his life is a phenomenal musician is very clever can't get himself up and dressed in the morning but you know <laughs> he can manage to, uh, to to play lots of Mozart um, and and he's just awesome but this vision, this sort of image that I get of my son, this feeling that I have towards my son, this gives me a phenomenal insight into the heart of God. Because you know when God looks at us, he knows all about us. He knows the things that we're no good at. He th knows the things that we're really good at. He knows the things that we've done wrong. There's nothing about us that he doesn't know. But the first thing that God sees when he looks at us is love. His heart just bursts with love and pride and joy for each one of us. Yeah, he knows what we're going through. He knows life's not always fair. He knows that things are going wrong for us. He knows when things are going right for us. But that's not his first thought. His first thought is just this awesome, amazing love for us. That's the God that I worship. That's the God that I want to follow. That's the God who helps me through my life. That's the God who puts his arms under my arms and helps me to carry my child. This is the God who's waiting with arms open wide, wanting each and every one of us to come into a relationship with him. This is the God who loves us. Would you like to sit down, please? Uh, I'm Philip, I'm the Bishop of Burnley. Now, I first met Archbishop Stephen about 25 years ago. And in those days, he wasn't the Archbishop of York. He was much, much more important than that. He was a parish priest. And he came to lead a mission in the parish where I was then working on the edge of Sunderland. And I vividly remember what he said in the planning meeting for that mission. He said, I'll do anything you like. He said, I'll do anything at all as long as I get my tea. That's what he said, isn't it? And you know, it's entirely true. We gave him his tea and he did anything we liked within the teaching of the church. He went to children's groups, he went to schools, he spoke to groups of older people, he played his guitar on the streets, he led mission services, he did anything. And what really massively blew me away was the way that it didn't matter what group of people he was in front of, he spoke the gospel with utter simplicity and with utter clarity. And I've spent the last 25 years trying and miserably failing to copy him. So I'm going to invite Archbishop Stephen onto the stage now. I'm going to pray for him that he might speak the gospel to us, to us tonight with clarity and simplicity. And then it's over to him.
Father, we thank you for Stephen. We thank you that you've called him to be Archbishop of York and given him a preacher's tongue. Lord, now give him the words to speak to us the gospel of your Son with clarity and with simplicity. And we pray that those in this room who are yet fully to respond to that gospel may hear it tonight and say yes. For you live and reign, God forever and ever. Amen. Uh, so, Philip, thank you so much. Uh, sisters and brothers, it's so nice to be with you. Uh, and, Philip, I do indeed remember that mission so well and, and with such fondness, not, not least uh, uh, for, for meeting you uh, and uh, when you had been ordained just, just a tiny amount of time. Um, and I rejoice in the way God has, has used you. Um, so, I thought I'd just tell you about how I became a follower of Jesus. That, that's all I thought I'd share with you this evening. Um, so I wasn't brought up going to church. So uh, there was no, no God, no church in my life growing up. Well, a, a, a tiny bit, I was baptised as a baby. So uh, my parents were part of the great post-war lapsed generation. Uh, so, I mean, have you noticed, if you scratch the surface of anybody over 80, 85 nowadays, it was my mum's 90th birthday last week, um, they proudly tell you how, when they were children, they went to church 17 times on a Sunday. <laughs> I usually re respond by saying, well, a fat lot of good it did you, because you don't go anymore. So my parents, they did go to church when they grew up, but they were part of that generation, and it happened to loads of people. They didn't reject the Christian faith, but for some reason or another, they just got out the habit. So when they got married and set up home, they just stopped going to church. So there was, however, enough God and church left inside them that me and my sister and my two brothers, we were done when we were babies. So I did make one visit to church for my baptism. Funnily enough, bit of an aside, uh, when I became... This was in Essex, so you can probably tell from the way I talk, I'm an Essex boy. Uh, and I come from Southend-on-Sea, which is a bit like the Blackpool of the South, a, a slightly smaller but equally amazing uh, seaside town. Uh, so um, when I became the Bishop of Chelmsford about 12 years ago, which is Essex and East London, I did a little video to introduce myself uh, to the diocese. And I think I told you earlier, I'm Stephen of Hadley. So Hadley is a town part of South End. And I thought, what I'll do is I'll go to the church in Hadley where I was baptised and I'll stand next to the font where I was baptised and I'll introduce myself to the people of the diocese and say, even though I didn't go to church growing up, I was baptised. So this is where my Christian journey began. And I spoke about this. It was a very moving film. When my mum saw it, she said, that's not where you were baptised. <laughs> And I said, I was, St Barnabas Hadley. That's the, it was on the, it's on the baptism certificate. I had to produce that to prove I was baptised before they'd let me be the archbishop, you know, let me be the bishop. And um, she said, no, 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 she says, when you were baptised, they hadn't finished building the church. You were baptised in the church hall. They used a pate bowl. <laughs> <laughs> so it wasn't a good start to my ministry. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd loudly told a fib uh, anyway. I was baptised, okay? That was my one visit to church as a child. So I grew up as like a, like a happy pagan, you know, just living my life like people do. Um, when my sister was about 10 or 11, she joined the Girl Guides. And at her Girl Guides, you were required to go to a church parade service once a month. So she and a small group of friends liked what they found at the church parade service, and so they started going on the other Sundays in between. They got confirmed, and they joined the church. This 
pricked my parents' conscience. Because like I said, they never rejected the Christian faith, they just gotten out the habit. So they start attending church with my sister. My little brother is still little enough to be told what to do, so he gets taken to church, thus leaving me and my elder brother back home in bed on a Sunday morning, flying the flag for agnosticism and being seriously worried because now our family has got religion. My elder brother was the first one to give way, and would you believe it, he starts going to church as well. Now, at this point in the story, I would love to be able to tell you with real honesty why I went to church for the first time, but the truth is, I cannot really quite remember. I do know that there was a girl, a friend of my sister's, This church had a youth group on a Sunday evening, and it was old-school youth group. You couldn't go to the youth group in the evening if you hadn't been to Mass in the morning. You know, it's it's not the worst way of getting young people in, but anyway, that was the rule in this church in those days. And I knew there was this friend of my sister's that I quite fancied who did go to the youth group in the evening, and that may have been, how shall we call it, a motivating factor in me going to church for the first time. The other thing that I did know was going on is, although we weren't a a Christian religious family, well, actually, it's interesting, my mum and dad would have called themselves Christians. They just didn't go to church. Um... But although we didn't go to church, we weren't a church family. We were, in in every other way, a very traditional kind of family. So some things really mattered. And Sunday lunch was always on the table at the same time. And we were expected to be there. And, And at Sunday lunch, we'd have these great discussions about all sorts of things. And nowadays, usually religion. And I wonder whether another motivation for me to... I did, by the way, I did... We are going to come on to why the Christian faith is a good thing in a minute, okay? Just bear with me. I can see some of you looking a bit worried about where they'd come to. So I wonder whether a motivation was that I thought to myself, if I go along to church and find out just how awful it really is, that will give me some ammunition to fire at them during our discussions on a Sunday morning. Anyway, aged, I think, about 13, for whatever the reason, I go to church for what is effectively the first time. And the thing that I suppose I want to try to get over to you is, I went to church for the first time fairly invested in not enjoying it. You know, I wasn't going for deep spiritual reasons, although having said that, I think I always believed in God. And since I've become a follower of Jesus, and now a priest and a bishop, it's my experience that most children do believe in God. You don't find many children who are atheists. And even though I didn't go to church, I can remember... as as even a tiny child, having some sense that God is real. Anyway, I go to church for the first time. What do I find? Well, the church I went to was what I'm going to call, for the sake of this evening, proper church, okay? No messing about. Bells, whistles, incense, you know, the whole, the full works. Um, I mean, I didn't, you know, I just thought this is what church is like. I didn't have any idea there were different sorts of church, but this was, this was the real deal. So I enter into this world which is weird and wonderful. Um, something amazing is going on, and I don't really understand it, but it, it has a deep, visceral impact on me. Um, the curate at the church was an ex-Durham miner. And when he preached, it felt to me... Have you ever had this experience when somebody's preaching and you feel as if they're speaking directly to you? 
Now, I can't tell you what he said. I can't really remember anything that he said. But I can to this day, and I think until the day I die, remember how it felt. It felt like he was speaking directly to me, and it felt as if he was speaking directly from God. And what I remember is just the challenge of his words that this God was real. Not only was this God real, but that I only had one life. And this one life of mine was not a dress rehearsal for the real thing. This was the life that I'd been given. And what was I going to do with this one life I'd been given? And somehow, the combination of the in-your-guts, here and nowness of his preaching and the weird and wonderful beyondness, the otherness of the worship where, well, you know, I wasn't the centre of attention in this place. In fact, no person was the centre of attention. Everything was focused beyond to, we don't know what to call it, do we? I'm going to call it the otherness of God, the beyondness of God, the beauty and awesomeness of God. There was something going on here which was both beyond and other and absolutely here and now. Now, you're probably thinking as I'm speaking that I had some Damascus Road flashing lights experience at this point. I didn't. I was completely thrown by what I experienced and I didn't know what to do with it. And what began at that point was what I think is probably better. Di- Have you ever done arm wrestling? Have you ever done, ar- done arm wrestling? I'm not very good at it, but you know what I mean. You need to nod here and let me know you know what arm wrestling is. Okay. So, so if you've ever arm wrestled against somebody who's a lot stronger than you, sometimes they toy with you, don't they? So they just hold you. Like you think you're doing well. You think you might even win, but they've only got to do a little nudge. They're stronger than you. That was me and God for the next few years. We, we started arm wrestling. And I wasn't ready to commit to God. I, I didn't know what to do with it. And sometimes I went to church and often I didn't go to church. But oh, something was going on inside of me. So how can I describe it? I think I arrived at a point later on in my teens when all I could say was, Lord, you win. Or or I might say, I was caught in the snare of the living God. And my life was completely mucked up. It was no longer going to be the life I thought it was going to be. But it was a new and a better and a richer and a deeper and a more beautiful and a more challenging life. Do you know, some of you may not, but let me quickly remind you, do you know the story of the feeding of the 5,000? Do you know that story? So it's a famous story in the Bible. You'll find it in John chapter 6. So just quickly remind you of the story. 5,000 people, Jesus preaching away. He's finished preaching away. He turns to his disciples and says, could you get them some lunch? The disciples say to Jesus, you're having a laugh, aren't you? A whole month's wages wouldn't be enough to buy lunch for this lot. But there's one small boy with his lunchbox. And his mum's made him some, I don't know, some fish paste sandwiches. And Jesus takes the bread and the fish. He breaks it, he blesses it, he shares it, and everyone is fed. You remember the story. So I'm going to call that day one. Because that it's at, it's at the beginning of John chapter 6, and most people never read on. But let's call that day one. So day one, 5,000 people are fed. If you read on, you get to day two. So day two, those 5,000 people, they come back again. Well, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, <laughs> I mean it makes sense, doesn't it? You've had a fantastic free lunch on day one. 
you are going to come back on day two. But on day two, Jesus doesn't feed them. On day two, Jesus says, I am the bread. And they don't like that. They, they can't make sense of that. that. That isn't what they've come for. Uh, and Jesus speaks at length about the fact that he is the bread, the real bread, the living bread. And as he says this, one by one, the crowds all disappear. And then you get to what, for me, is kind of almost the saddest bit of the whole gospel story, because right at the end of John chapter 6, Jesus is alone, just with the 12 disciples. Everyone else has gone. It's too difficult. And he's alone with the 12 disciples, and he turns to them, and he says, I suppose you're going to go as well. And at that point, Peter steps forward. And Peter says to Jesus, where else can we go? Which I think means, if there is an exit, show me the exit. But then he says, you have the words of eternal life. Now, Peter's story is also my story. Maybe this may not make sense to you, but I'm not sure I wanted to be a Christian. I'm not sure I wanted to be a follower of Jesus. I had other plans for my life. And following Jesus isn't easy. It's challenging. It, it asks us to live differently, to inhabit the world differently, to stop putting yourself at the centre. I don't, I don't want to pretend to you it's easy because it isn't. But I arrived at a point where with Peter I found myself saying, where else can I go? That once you've caught a glimpse of the living God and who God is in Jesus Christ, and that he alone is the bread of life. There is nowhere else to go. And so I decided to follow him. And that's what I've been trying to do for the rest of my life. However... I've got one more, well, maybe two more, but definitely one more thing to tell you. So that's, that's my story of how I became a follower of Jesus. But years after that happened, when I was ordained as a deacon in the Church of God, um, there was a big service for the ordination, and I invited to the service my Auntie Millie. Now, my, my Auntie Millie, she wasn't really my... You know in your family you have these people, you call them Auntie and Uncle, but they're not really your Auntie and Uncle. So my Auntie... You've, you've got them in your family, yeah. So my Auntie Millie, she was my grandma's best friend. And, and all my growing up, Auntie Millie was someone, an important person in my life, I called her Auntie. My Auntie Millie was a devout Roman Catholic. The sort of devout Roman Catholic who went to Mass pretty much every single day of her life. When I was ordained as a deacon, I invited Auntie Millie to the service, and my Auntie Millie, I think, would have then written to the Pope to get special dispensation <laughs> to worship at a non-Roman Catholic because you know, she, she was that kind of old school Roman Catholic. She hadn't ever worshipped anywhere else. Anyway, she came to the service. She was pleased for me. And at the kind of bun fight after the service, this is what she told me. She told me that every single day of my life, in fact, even when I was in my mother's womb before I was born. She had made her intention at Mass, which she went to pretty much every day of her life, that my family, 
her best friend Betty, my grandma's family, that we would come to the Christian faith. She had prayed for us every single day. But she'd never told me or anyone till that day. Of course, I think my Auntie Millie rather hoped we would become Roman Catholics. <laughs> but on that day, she was prepared to concede that maybe the Church of England was an acceptable second best. You know, she was prepared to concede that. But when I heard that story, in my heart, so many things changed. Because I've just told you a story about how I became a follower of Jesus, and I told you about the things that I did and the decisions I made and the things that I decided to do. And then I discovered that throughout my life, there had been someone praying for me. And I honestly believe that one of the reasons I am standing here this evening talking to you is because of my Auntie Millie's prayers. So, let's try to draw some of this together. When I look back over my story of how I became a follower of Jesus, I realise that God has woven into my story many, many other people for whom I am deeply thankful. First of all, there was my sister, aged 11. I don't remember my sister ever saying anything to me about her newfound Christian faith. Yet, her silent witness brought faith to the whole of my family. And then I think of those girl guide leaders. They must have been pretty incredible people that they had so communicated the reality of faith to that little group of 11-year-old girls that through them, my whole family came to faith. And isn't God good sometimes? About 10, 15 years ago, I happened by chance to meet one of them. And I was able to say, thank you. Thank you for your great witness and service. And then I think of that church. You know, I don't remember much about it, but it must have been a welcoming church. The worship in that church must have been real and vibrant. The preaching in that church was certainly powerful and challenging. And then, underneath, behind it all, a kind of pulse and heartbeat throughout my life, there was someone praying for me. So for those of you here this evening who are Christians, could I say this to you? How might God be able to weave you into somebody else's life? Sometimes we get frightened of this word evangelism, to share the Christian faith with others. Evangelism is teamwork. I know that. That's how I became a Christian. It's something we all do in different ways. And you might be one of those silent witnesses who, who just the example of your life of faith will make a difference. Or you might be like a girl guide leader who does things in the church and in the community to witness to your faith. Or you might be involved in leading the worship of the church. Or you might have a preaching or a teaching or an evangelistic ministry. Or you might be an Auntie Millie. You might be someone whose prayers will change people's lives, even though you may never know it. And for those of you here this evening who are not yet followers of Jesus and not sure where you are with God, or maybe people here who just, your faith has, you know, gone a bit off the boil, maybe you feel you're on spiritual autopilot. I, I do want to say to you, um, I can't do it like that curate who was a Durham miner did it. But I do want to say to you, the gospel is real. God is real. W without it, there is nothing. And that if, like me, you look at our world at the moment, and you see so much pain and so much uncertainty, so much confusion, so much suffering, 
If you long for the world to be different, if you long it for yourself and for your family, then, then where else can we go? Who else can show us how to live? Who else can bring peace to our hearts and to the world? You know, I'm a simple soul. And my understanding of the Christian faith is simply this. In Jesus, God shows us this is what humanity is meant to be like. Uh, and that we are made for community with God. And what Jesus does for us in his dying and in his rising is he brings us into community with God. Uh, and dear sisters and brothers, this is available to all of us. Where else? Where else will we human beings find the peace we long for? Okay, some people say, they often say it to me, some people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. To which I reply, yes, and there's room for one more. <laughs> Come and join us. We don't pretend to be anything other than sinners taking the cure. That's us, the people of God. Yeah, we're a bit muddled. Yeah, we get it wrong. And we are definitely in need of God's grace and forgiveness. But we don't pretend to be anything else. And we want you to join us because together we can change the world. So, one last story to finish. Um, I, I became a granddad during lockdown, which is fantastic. So if you're a grandparent, you'll know what a joy it is. Um, and uh, our grandson now, he's, he'll be two in, a, in about a month or so. And when he comes to stay with us, um, we take him out in the buggy. And when I take him, he's obviously a very good-looking lad. He takes after his granddad. So <laughs> when I take him out in the buggy, I have that experience, which I'm sure you've had um, with, with, with your beautiful daughter. I have this experience where total strangers come up to me, well not to me, they come up to Ezra, our grandson, they come up and they look into the buggy and they do that kind of thing we grown-ups do when we see a small baby. They kind of oogle and google at the baby and make kind of baby noises and faces and they oogle it and they say, oh, isn't he beautiful? Oh, he's so beautiful. And then they look at me and say, oh, you know, oh, he takes after his granddad, doesn't he? Or that, you know... It always got his mum's eyes, you know, that we, we have that conversation. And you can't go for a walk with a small child without having the... And it's, it's lovely. And, and, and when I'm doing it with my grandson, I remember doing it with my son. Same happened with my sons. But then I found myself thinking, I may be getting a bit too old and a bit too crazy. I started thinking, well, that happened to me when I was a baby. Yeah, my mum took me in my pram for a walk in the park and total strangers looked inside my pram and they looked at me and they oogled and googled and said, isn't he beautiful? <laughs> and then I thought to myself, well, if it happened to Ezra and it happened to my sons and if it happened to me, well, actually, this is something we've all got in common. This happened to you. Once upon a time, when you were a tiny baby, total strangers looked into your pram, they looked at you, and they said, isn't she beautiful? And I do mean everyone. Boris Johnson. I mean, <laughs> what a little chubby, oochie-coochie baby I bet he was. Or, you know, or, or B Bishop Julian. I mean, I think he would have been a lovely bouncy baby. Or Rich Richie Sunak, I bet he's a lovely baby. Or, um, or Vladimir Putin. <laughs> or Adolf Hitler. It is something that will have happened to everyone. And why do we do that? Is it that we forget 
that every human being, including a tiny baby, is a model with potential to do wonderful, great things, but also inbuilt a potential to do terrible things, what we in the church call sin, getting things wrong. Do we forget that that is true for a baby just as much as it's true for us? Or is it that in that moment when we delight in a small baby just because they are and see how beautiful they are, is it that in that moment we are seeing someone else as God sees us? Because God knows what a model we are, but God sees us and delights in us. God sees us and thinks we are very, very beautiful. And God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to sort out the muddle in the human heart so that we might die to sin and all the things that go wrong and live for him, not just here on earth, but for eternity. So, why don't we try this? Would you like, if you're able, please, to stand? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to invite you in a moment to turn to the person around you and in your imagination, I want you to look into their pram. Or if that, I know we've, we've got some clergy here and some theologians, if that's a little bit too basic for you, we could perhaps imagine, imagine that we're looking into each other's font. The day that we were, not just the day we were born, the day we were reborn into the life of Christ. And what I'd like you to do is say to each other, Wow, you are so beautiful. <laughs> so we can look at each other as God looks at us, seeing what we could be. You see, something I, something I say to confirmation candidates is, God does want to change you, but not into someone else. That's what the world offers. You know, the world says, do you know what, if you just... You know, you need to get, certainly with me, you need to get yourself a wig, you need to lose some weight, um, uh, you need to get a facelift, uh, you need to get some designer label jeans, a, a, a new car, a certain perfume. You could purchase your way to happiness. None of it works. Or maybe it works just enough to get you addicted. No, God does want to change you, but not into somebody else, into you, the beautiful you that God cherishes in God's heart. So please... Look at each other as God sees you and say to each other, Boy, oh, you are beautiful. Shall we give it a go? <laughs> you are very... We've got a beautiful band. You're a beautiful band. What a beautiful band. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. Thank you. So, now, I, I promise, I, I, I've nearly finished, I've nearly finished. So I've just got, I've got something else I have to tell you. Now this is going to, this is going to shock you, okay? This is going to shock you. But, it, but I feel I have to tell you, in the, in the cause of truth and transparency, I have to tell you, I can't remember, this is amazing, it's true though, I can't remember the last time a total stranger stopped me in the street and said to me, Poor Stephen, you are beautiful. I mean, it, I mean, it's flabbergasting, isn't it? You just have to take my word for it. It hasn't happened for a long time. But maybe, maybe, 
if we started seeing each other as God sees us, if we started cherishing each other as God cherishes us, um, then the true inner beauty which comes from knowing Christ would shine out of us. When, when we finish in a little while, um, if you'd like somebody to pray for you, you know, we're, we're here, there's going to be people here that can come and pray for you. If you just want somebody to bless you and, and, and affirm you and assure you that you are deeply, deeply loved by God, or if maybe you're at that place that I was at many years ago where you're saying, I don't really know where else to go. And maybe this evening I've just caught a glimpse of who Jesus is. And please, please, um, you know, do come forward, come to someone. And we would love to help you take your next steps in knowing and following Jesus Christ. Amen.